So, um, for my disclosures, none, none of which are relevant to this talk. Um, this is a slide I borrowed from my partner, Dan Kelly, uh, but I think it's an appropriate slide. And basically, you know, when we talk about understanding how complications occur in endonasal surgery, it happens along a timeline uh, that starts with patient selection, um, your own experience, your institution's uh, experience and equipment and instrumentation that we have. Uh, at some point, you'll reach a point of no return, and that point is when the patient is wheeled into the operating room. And then uh, there's various phases in the operating room, the nasal phase, the cellar phase, uh, tumor resection, and then the reconstruction. And then there's the perioperative phases where there's in-house and post-operative phases where at each point of these areas, uh, one can have challenges that can result in complications. And so it's important to think about complications before uh, you even set foot in the operating room with the patient. These are major complications that we think about in, in order of severity. Um, the most common you know, uh, are, are somewhere in the middle of this list. And um, while I don't think I have time in the 15 minutes to talk of, uh, about every single complication, I'm gonna to touch upon two that I think are, are necessary and critical. And then I wanted to talk briefly about minor complications, which I'll just have one slide on. Uh, this is a contemporary series of endonasal endoscopic pituitary adenoma series. And you can see the overall range of complications. Um, and in particular, when you look at CSF leaks and carotid injuries, which are the two uh, areas that I'll be talking about in detail, you can see the average range for CSF leak is between 1% and 5% for these large series. Uh, for, and for carotid artery injury, it's between 0 and 1%. However, if you look at specific series, so for example, from Pittsburgh, uh, Maria Kuturusiu uh, discussed giant adenomas, the CSF leak rate was much higher. Um, and take, for example, a Cushing's disease cases where the CSF leak is much lower. So there's a lot of variability based on pathology, even in the adenoma population, let alone the non-adenomatous uh, tumors. So many of you are familiar with this quote, but maybe you're not familiar with this quote. This is from one of my favorite movies um, where the Admiral is asking Jack Ryan, you know, how are they gonna get their submarine to us? And they basically say that everything is done in that, in that culture with a plan from step one. And I think that's how we should be operating in the uh, operating room. So um, the idea of a graded repair uh, in uh, endoscopic surgery is important. And um, we have, uh, based on a paper and work from Dan Kelly from 15 years ago, have uh, graded CSF leaks into three, uh, really four grades, zero to three. And um, we actually apply a different closure technique based on the grade of the CSF leak. It allows us to become much more targeted. In the operating room, we have certain things that we do before we even get into tumor resection. One is that we save the sphenoid sinus mucosa, um, unless we're actually putting in a flap like a nasal septal or middle alternative flap. Uh, we repurpose that later on. And that's important because um, it actually uh, preserves the nasociliary function of the uh, mucosal tissue there and helps prevent crusting and postnasal drip. We save the bone that we remove. We, act, we don't destroy the bone. Actually, we're, we're harvesting bone on the way in, which we sometimes use as a buttress for our closure. We anticipate the uh, diaphragmatic descent. And that actually is very helpful in verifying tumor resection. But also, in some cases, uh, reconstruction is, is altered by how low the diaphragm may be in your field. Um, particularly in the superior aspect along the tuberculum, if it's an adenoma, we try to avoid early exposure in that area just so we don't get an early leak. Because an early anterior leak can be very challenging to repair uh, and has a higher risk of, of postoperative CSF leak. Um, on the inferior aspect, do some people advocate advocate taking the entire floor of the cell off. We actually advocate leaving a little bit of a shelf there to allow, if you are gonna use fat reconstruction, to allow the fat to sit in there and to um, stay properly in that location. And uh, also same thing with lateral bone edges if we are gonna wedge a, a rigid buttress. 
even if we don't have a CSF leak, we we often will use fat. We're we're very lipophilic, and um, we feel that fat is helpful. Fat has adipose stem cells, so I think it has some value in in wound healing and scarring. And who knows if it has any impact on the gland function? We're we're still studying that. But also in a large uh, defect, uh, you can delay the um, pituitary gland descent and the optic chiasm descent, which in some cases can cause hypopituitarism or vision loss. So there's some value in in keeping that mass uh, there and let the fat slowly get absorbed. And of course, we perform an intraoperative Valsalva. Postoperative, we will obtain a CT scan on anybody who has a CSF leak because we want to see how much um, air there is, how much pneumocephalus there is. This isn't really important critically um, at the time of uh, the patient care, but should the patient come in with fluid draining from their nose, we're not sure if it's a CSF leak, could be just arrogant, um, we get a scan. And if there's no new air, then we understand that maybe it's not necessarily a true leak. Um, or if there's a significant amount of change in, in pneumocephalus, then we realize, oh, it is a leak. Or in some cases, uh, it makes our decision very clear whether we operate or put in a lumbar drain. Um, we often will use CSF diversion pharmacologically with acetazolamide. Um, we do not use lumbar drains anymore except for specific cases like spontaneous CSF leaks. And we do perform what's called a tip test or tilt test prior to the discharge to make sure there's no uh, leakage before the patient leaves the room. Um, in our series that we published a few years ago, Andrew Conger was our, our lead author on this. We had 509 patients um, who had a variety of different types of uh, pathology resected. You can see the breakdown here. Um, these are the different um, material that we use. So almost every patient will have a collagen sponge place. We use Helostat, which uh, works very well in nasal reconstruction and is one quarter of the cost of Duragen, uh, just to put it out there. Abdominal fat, as I mentioned, we're very uh, lipophilic. We will often use some sort of buttress, whether it's a rigid buttress like um, bone or an artificial rigid buttless buttress like Medpor graft, the TSI implant, um, or we will use removable rigid buttresses like the mirror cell packing, which uh, has been very helpful for our reconstruction techniques and allows us to, to really expand the ability um, with our flat placements. Often we, we will use uh, Tisteal as glue. In some cases, uh, Adherus, depending on if we're using a flap or not, but glue is often used, with, uh, the only exception being for Rathke's cleft cysts when we are marsupializing the cyst. And uh, we talked about pharmacological and, and uh, no lumbar drain uh, CSF diversion. We, in this series, use only 2% of adenomas had a vascularized flap, but you, we do recognize that other pathology have a higher rate of flap utilization. So this is a grade one CSF leak. A grade one CSF leak is a weeping leak. So barely a small amount of fluid that you see. Grade two, you'll see a continual stream of fluid, uh, very clearly CSF coming into your field. And then grade three, you're basically looking at the subarachnoid spaces. So those are the three grades of leaks. And a grade one leak, uh, for example, on a, a standard adenoma like this, um, we will uh, often use fat, collagen sponge, plus or minus a bone graft, um, plus or minus nasal packing. Depends on patient's habitus, but this is our typical closure for our patient. Um, for a grade three leak, so for example, a craniopharyngioma here, uh, we will initially close with uh, fat, collagen. The collagen is actually cut to just the area of the defect. It will put a rigid buttress in place. This is the native bone there. You can see there's no sphenoid sinus mucosa. It's all been stripped because we're going to place a nasal septal flap. There's the flap there. You can see it's pedicled down. And then we use uh, uh, tissue glue to hold that in place or adhere us. And then a, a bit more fat to allow for the mirror cell uh, packing to, to sit very nicely there. We do place another layer of collagen sponge just in case the packing sticks to the sponge. And then here we actually are putting the scope through the mirror cell packing so we know exactly where it's going and we're directing the pressure from the packing directly to the collagen sponge or the flap that we need to compress. 
and we will often use two flaps, the two packs there. You can see, um, you can see the uh, packing there uh, in your reconstruction here. So um, let's see if I can get a pointer. So here, um, here is the mirror cell packing right here, and there's the bony uh, reconstruction. We also can appreciate the pneumocephalus in this patient who has some intraventricular and subarachnoid pneumocephalus, very typical for a craniopharyngioma operation. And uh, again, if this patient presented with uh, nasal fluid drainage a few days after surgery, um, we'll compare and see if this air is better or worse. And that's one of the features that we use to determine if they're actually having a leak in addition to the usual fluid analyses. So this was the typical reconstruction. You actually can see the enhancement of the flap here. If you see a non-enhancing flap, that doesn't necessarily mean the flap is dead. Uh, we actually are publishing our series of uh, flap perfusion on MRI, which notes that uh, about, uh, about a third of patients have a non-enhancing flap, and the majority of these um, continue to have an enhancing flap at three months, as you can see here. Uh, and even if you don't have enhancing flap at three months, the CSF leak rates are quite low. So um, there's no prediction that a non-enhancing flap will result in a CSF leak. Um, and I say this because some people will actually use that as an opportunity to maybe go back in and reassess the flap. And we don't think it's, it's actually necessary in the majority of patients. This is our multi-layered repair. And you can see just, again, fat in the subarachnoid space, not necessarily going too deep, but you really want to get a good apposition to the dural exposure. And then we have the dural collagen inlay, bone, flap, more fat, more collagen, and then the, the mirror cell gauze. So when we looked at our, our reconstruction and, and then based on grade, and grade zero means no leak, um, you can see that uh, almost every patient had collagen. About 30% of our grade zero patients had fat, um, but nearly all the patients um, with grade three leaks had fat. The flaps were primarily in our grade three CSF leaks. We did use some for people who didn't have a leak, usually those that had exposed carotids, and we were worried about uh, them being exposed to the elements. Um, some sort of buttress, usually uh, a, a soft buttress and oftentimes a rigid buttress uh, has been very helpful. Um, and then, uh, and then tissue glue, as I mentioned, and uh, temporary buttresses, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we do not use fascia lata. That does not appear to be a major issue for us. I think the fascia lata harvest site is very um, challenging for some patients cosmetically and also uh, physiologically and functionally. So we have moved away from that. And as I mentioned, no lumbar drainage. One of the key things with lumbar drainage is it, it keeps you tied to a bed. It's harder to ambulate. You also are stuck in the hospital for a few days. Um, whereas if you ambulate a patient early on, and this was published by the Italian group, Cavallo's group, the three Fs, uh, fat, flap, and flash, if I'm saying it correctly. And the idea is you want to get patients up and moving as early as post-op day zero. The sooner you do that, the lower their intracranial pressures go and the less chance of a CSF leak. And uh, that's something that we believe in, um, in uh, Santa Monica, and we've been uh, incorporating that. It also helps with other comorbidities like DVT prevention, atelectasis, pneumonias, things that you'd expect from a sedentary situation. This is our outcomes here. Overall, our CSF leak rate was about 1%, 1.1%. You can see um, when we had a repair, uh, it was about 1.6%. Uh, and uh, we did actually change our protocol about halfway through the series. And you can see how our CSF leak rate dropped as a result of our change in our protocol here. Um, so these are the CSF leak rates based on pathology. Our biggest uh, offenders are meningiomas and craniopharyngiomas. No real surprise there. Definitely better than the previously published series uh, from the early you know, uh, 2000s, uh, but I think most contemporary series are having a similar leak rate for these types of pathology. Um, our, uh, for grade three leaks, so uh, high, high level leaks, um, the failure rates are actually lower for other types of pathology, including adenomas. Uh, 
Uh, here's our adenoma series here at the top. And you can see overall uh, our leak rate um, dependent varying uh, on macroadenoma versus microadenoma. Meningitis rates were quite low, but they did correlate with having a CSF leak for the most part uh, as compared to meningiomas and craniopharyngiomas. The overall failure rate for an adenoma was 1.4% with a meningitis rate of 0.6%. For cranios, 4% for, 4 for each. And this was just our, our breakdown here. And you can see, um, first of all, the microscopic error. This was the paper that Esposito and Dan Kelly published years ago. And they, they themselves had a paradigm shift in that series that showed that their CSF leak rate dropped from 4% to 1.2%. And specifically for grade three CSF leaks, dropped from 18% to 7%. And then in our series, um, when we look at uh, overall, our failure rate dropped to about 1% and for grade three leaks from 9% to 2%. So we're continuing this line of really trying to get down to zero-ish. In my mind, we should really have post-operative CSF leaks be a, a never event and try everything possible to avoid those. And this is our, our idea of how we manage these leaks. Um, we also use kind of a belts and suspenders approach. The idea being that we would upgrade a reconstruction based on a patient's habitus. So if they look like they're high, high risk for a leak, obesity, sleep apnea, prior radiation, prior CSF leak, um, lack of good reconstructive uh, uh, milieu, then we will maybe even raise a flap for a grade two leak. Um, so those are I, things that we incorporate in our reconstruction. Now, a bit about carotid artery injury, shifting gears. So carotid artery injury primarily is about situational awareness. And uh, this is just the goddess Wajid and the eye of Ra. You can see these two snakes around the sun god. That second snake are the carotid arteries, and the sun god is um, your, your pituitary tumor that you're taking out. And I love quoting Danny here, Danny Prevedello, who says, if you're going to play with snakes, be prepared to be bitten. Um, so ICA injury and endonasal surgery is potentially catastrophic, could happen from any sort of mechanism, and we'll talk about that briefly. It can lead to fatal hemorrhage, carotid occlusion, dissection, embolism, stroke. These are all the, the, the scary things. Uh, very uncommon, uh, somewhere between 0 and 4%. We, we think this is underreported. Most of these are from uh, surveys. Ivan Shurik had uh, surveyed this 30, nearly 30 years ago uh, and noted that surgeons experienced um, uh, inversely is related to carotid injury. And it's possible that just everyone gets those one or two injuries in their career and they learn the techniques to avoid them over time. Um, and so with experience comes, comes wisdom. Um, so these are different mechanisms of uh, carotid injury. So you can see people, um, and these are all, by the way, uh, videos shared by colleagues who want to educate others on, you know, how to avoid these in the future. But kerosene rongers, excessive cautery with monopolar cautery, it's very dangerous over the carotid. Uh, torquing, uh, you know, the middle clinoid or other pieces of bone by the carotid can result in a laceration and, and probably a more common drill injury. But any sort of instrument that we use can result in um, carotid artery injury. Um, so we think it really should be a never event. It's important to know where the uh, carotid arteries live um, in, in respect to your patient. And so understanding the preoperative anatomy is really critical. Understanding the intercavernous carotid distance, which is where your majority of the time you'll be working. Note that the cavernous and the petrous carotids often are dehiscent in the sphenoid sinus. So uh, taking a dissector over that, that may be a little bit sharp can result in a carotid injury. Um, one, uh, Fernandez Miranda talked about uh, nasal septations, and while they seem to be a midline marker, the majority of the time they're actually um, markers of the carotid artery, and so we, we monitor that uh, and map them out carefully in the operating room. What do we do to avoid injury? Navigation is helpful, especially in redo operations where the anatomy is distorted. The Doppler, very critical. We'll talk about that briefly later. Large bore suction. We Fat graft is uh, necessary for any case, but muscle grafts, which you can get from the abdomen, from the tongue, from the um, 
from the fascia lata location, all of those will be very helpful for a carotid artery injury. And you must crush the muscle for best effect because it releases that thromboplastin to help with hemostasis. Muslin gauze, which is basically a type of cotton, is very helpful for small punctures. And we use this intracranially as well. Um, IV heparin is helpful. And then having aneurysm clips with endonasal applicators and alerting your neural IR team. The Doppler is very critical. We use it on all cases. We map out the carotid. And in some cases, if they're large tumors and they're invading the cavernous sinus or, or other vasculature, uh, we will Doppler while doing our resection because sometimes those vessels will shift location. And um, if you, you Doppler and you don't hear the carotid, check your instrumentation. Sometimes that could be the issue and not necessarily that you're not near the carotid yet. This was um, a series from Dan as well a few years ago that showed that by implementing the Doppler, the carotid injury rate dropped precipitously compared to not using the Doppler. And so I would advocate that anybody doing endonasal surgery should use the Doppler um, before any dural um, incision and even during resection. So what happens if you do get a carotid injury? Well, first, take your own pulse, calm down. It's much like any other uh, surgical catastrophe. Control hemorrhage, large bore suction, uh, tamponade um, with various agents. There's a hover technique to give you visualization of where things are. Uh, Gabby Zada and others have great models that can help you practice this because you really don't want to learn it on the fly uh, if that happens to you. A carotid compression. Once you have a control, determine the extent of injury. Is it a little puncture or is it a laceration or an avulsion? You know, that will help you figure out how you're going to reconstruct or, uh, or sacrifice a carotid. Puncture wounds uh, can be re reconstructed. Muslin gauze, collagen sponge, muscle are all very helpful. Sometimes an a endonasal clip can be utilized if it's very clear where the issue is. If a wide laceration or avulsion, then we probably need to sacrifice the vessel, which can be relatively safe in the vast majority of patients. Um, after stabilization, you, know, you may want to consider further tumor resection, although for the most part, probably best to finish your operation Take the patient to the angiogram, the IR suite. Make sure there isn't any um, residual um, pseudoaneurysm or defect. And also continue to monitor these patients very frequently for the first few weeks where you really want to make sure you have multiple rounds of vascular imaging as pseudoaneurysms can develop rapidly and um, you want to stay on top of that. We use a checklist in the operating room. Um, part of our timeout, if there's a high-risk type patient, these are our high-risk patients, meningiomas, chordomas, fibrous adenomas, invasive paracellular tumors, prior radiation, or prior surgery. We have a pre-incision timeout that we talk about exactly what we need in case there should be a carotid injury. And then should there be an injury, this is what we follow. These include things that you may not think about, in the heat of the moment, this is the same concept as the airline pilots use. So it makes sure it covers all your bases and um, helps uh, everyone be prepared. And just doing this exercise just uh, increases the alertness of the staff and the nurses and the anesthesiologists in the operating room to make sure they understand that they need to be on heightened, heightened alert in this type of case. This was a series um, uh, of a number of patients from various uh, uh, institutions that James Liu published a few years ago looking at carotid injury. Um, interestingly, the majority of patients did well. M more, uh, more than 75% of patients had normal outcome. Five patients with the initial postoperative deficit, only one had per permanent neurological deficit, and five patients died from their injuries. So it's a scary situation, but it doesn't necessarily mean the patient is going to die. There's a, there is a chance, but it's not a, a very large chance. And I think your goal really should be to try to stabilize the patient and to repair the defect and keep calm during the process and then um, hope that the patient has a good outcome. So tips um, you know, on, on minimizing failure, you want to make sure you have a strong team, multidisciplinary team. Understand the anatomy of each case. Really become an expert in non-surgical therapies as well, just so you understand uh, the, the various options. Uh, under, uh, respect quality of life. We didn't, we didn't talk about this in this lecture, but that's an important aspect in endonasal surgery. For carotids, you know, respect the carotid, localize it, have a plan of attack to repair it. Uh, 
have a reliable exit strategy for skull-based reconstruction, and then of course, follow your patients long-term and learn from your complications. And finally, just a word about minor complications. You know, we talk about major complications, but they happen infrequently. But these issues can happen quite frequently, and they they may affect the perception of a patient's um, or a patient's perception on whether they had a good surgery, and um, uh, if they if they reach their outcomes here. And so they can be anesthesia related risks, positioning related risks, oral complications, sinonasal complications, back graft site issues. We've certainly seen those. Uh, endocrine-related issues and CSF diversion complications. And I have a whole lecture on this, but we obviously don't have time to talk about that. And as I mentioned, surround yourself with a strong team. Thank you very much.